Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome again to the Southeast Asia Climate and Health Responder Course brought to you by the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health's Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education, the Planetary and Global Health Program of the St. Luke's Medical Center College of Medicine in the Philippines, and Healthcare Without Harm Southeast Asia. Again, I'm Dr. Renzo Guinto, the Director of the Planetary and Global Health Program of St. Luke's, and I will be moderating today's session. Again, welcome to session number four, which will focus on climate change and non-communicable diseases. So I'm seeing uh, co our co-learners saying hello to everybody in the chat box. And how is the course so far? We would love to hear your top of mind feedback uh, in the chat box. Of course, later on, we will be sending a much more comprehensive uh, evaluation form. I remember in the past three sessions, everybody was excited about the post-course survey. You will get the post-course survey after the course. So, um, and, and I hope that um, you will also uh, continue to attend our sessions all the way to the very end. And uh, by the way, today, uh, our session um, uh, will, you know, the slides for this session, unfortunately, will not be shared, but the recording of this session will be shared with everybody. And if you are uh, looking for the uh, past uh, at least two sessions, I think session one and session two are already posted in the YouTube channel of the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education. That YouTube channel is also a great resource for uh, other you know, webinars and uh, sessions and uh, lectures on this you know, vast and exciting new space of climate change and health. So I, now I'm reading some uh, positive feedbacks uh, from some of you in the chat box. Thank you very much for your continuous uh, participation and interest. I'm also seeing that we have colleagues from different parts of the world, even you know, not just from Asia and not just from Southeast Asia. We have colleagues from India. We also have colleagues from South Africa. So that's not any more part of Southeast Asia. This just shows how global, you know, this course is and how important uh, this issue is to all peoples of the world, uh, to all health professionals across the world. We also have someone from Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina. Muchas gracias for joining us today. So, and Mexico as well. So, wow, this is amazing. Uh, and, and hopefully we can do more of these courses in other regions of the world. I think we um, didn't mention in the first session when we introduced the consortium that we already offered this course in the Caribbean, in, I believe, Latin America. Uh, now it's Southeast Asia Stern. And hopefully we will bring this to the other regions of the world. You know, I already have a friend that was asking, when are we going to bring this climate and health responders, responder course to Africa? So please uh, stay tuned and we look forward to collaborating uh, with more regions in the months and years to come. So today, let's cut to the chase and let's begin. Uh, by the way, I want to remind everybody to please keep yourselves muted, even your cameras uh, turned off, uh, if possible, maybe later during the conversation, you can turn it on as well. Uh, we will uh, encourage you to use the chat box for comments, questions, also share you know, resources that you have. We really are thrilled to witness a culture of uh, knowledge exchange and information sharing during the first three sessions. Let's continue doing that. So now let me quickly introduce our speaker for session four, again, on climate change and non-communicable diseases. She is a pulmonologist, the head of the Air Pollution and Climate Change Committee 
of the Philippine College of Chest Physicians. Let's give a warm welcome to our speaker for today, Dr. Miriam Yano Lalas. Dr. Miriam, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your expertise. The microphone is yours. Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Ren. So yeah, it's really nice to see all the nice feedback we're getting in the chat box. So yeah, I'm really glad that everyone's enjoying the course so far. Um, I'd like to start uh, by sharing my screen. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Sorry, I, I'm hot. The options are not appearing this time. I don't know why. Let me just try to fix it. Hmm. Okay, I'm sorry for the delay. So while we're waiting, um, let me acknowledge uh, the presence of a few more participants or co-learners. We have a colleague from Antigua and Barbuda. Wow, thank you for joining us. Uh, and one participant was saying that the subject is a worldwide issue, hence many participants. Um, and and uh, this is like, wow, a, a, a global class Zoom that we're having. So we also have someone from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So we have several colleagues from the Caribbean. I'm really, really impressed. And of course, from Malawi and Ghana, from Africa, my friend Rudolf is there. Um, and of course, Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh. So the Southeast, the South Asian uh, uh, region is also represented here. And of course, our colleagues from Southeast Asia, from Malaysia, from Singapore, from Thailand, and of course, from the Philippines. And by the way, to the Filipinos, especially those who are based in Luzon, um, you know, right now I'm joining you from Calamba City, my hometown. And in the morning, we had an earthquake. And in the afternoon, we had torrential rains. So that just shows... Uh, our country's uh, vulnerability to many different kinds of uh, shocks. And we therefore need to um, be prepared and to be equipped with uh, you know, knowledge and skills so that we can address as a, as a health sector to the health impacts of these uh, uh, events. Uh, and I hope you remember session two where uh, Dr. Ron Lau uh, gave a talk about uh, the um, uh, disasters and extreme weather events. Dr. Miriam, everything okay? Um, yeah, I, I'm having difficulties uh, sharing my slides. I mean, the, the option is not there. I, I know we tested this earlier and it's not appearing right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, but let me try again. Does someone else has a copy that maybe we can just share it from another laptop? Okay. I'm Colleagues? Excited. Yep. Yeah. How about now? Uh, yes, it's now visible. Okay, let me check how I can operate this. Okay, now we can see everything. Okay. Yep. Thank okay. You. Okay. Back okay. to you, Dr. Lalas. Yes. Yeah. Again, sorry for that technical glitch. Uh, okay. 
So good evening, everyone. Yeah, before I begin, again, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to share my thoughts. on this very important and very timely and relevant topic. I will be talking about climate change and non-communicable diseases and nutrition. Sorry, I can't turn on my video if I'm flashing like this. So I hope it's okay with everyone. Yep, it's okay. We'll just turn on your video during the Q&A. Okay. So the learning objectives for this session are one, to discuss how climate change and variability impacts key underlying causes of non-communicable diseases such as cardiorespiratory disease, secondary to air pollution, heat-related illness, and undernutrition due to food insecurity. And two, to define steps the health sector can take to address the growing burden of NCDs in the era of a warming planet. This is a list of the leading causes of death globally in 2000 and year 2019. Out of the seven out of the 10 are NCDs, meaning those conditions that do not result from an infectious process, which is typically acute and hence are not communicable, like ischemic heart disease, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cancers of the airway, dementias, diabetes mellitus, and kidney diseases. Now, out of the 55.4 million deaths, 41 million or 74% are caused by NCDs. 17 million of these deaths are premature or death occurring before the age of 70, just at 10 to 20 years older than the age when people are at the prime of their lives. Now, the NCD burden has a wide range of implications. Aside from its effect on the health of individuals and the population, it also has a big impact on the socioeconomic development of a country. Because most NCDs tend to be chronic, the treatment is often long and costly. This results in high treatment costs that can be felt in households with all the out-of-pocket spending despite some form of health insurance. In the healthcare system, because of the increased demand for health services, and society as a whole, because there's pressure to increase public health spending, and it comes with an opportunity cost. We can't anymore invest that money for other purposes. Now, aside from this direct cost, NCDs cost us in the form of productivity losses because of premature mortality, because these individuals are supposedly at the prime of their lives and contributing members of the society. It can also cost us productivity loss through early exit from the labor market because of health issues or because they have to take care of someone, stay home, who, who is sick, absenteeism, and work at lowered capacity because of disabilities. And because NCDs disproportionately affect low- and middle-income countries, where three out of four cases of NCD deaths occur, they can drive people deeper into poverty, worsen existing inequalities, and hamper the economic development of a country. Now, what, what does climate change have to do in all these? Basically, three of the major modifiable risk factors for NCDs share the same origins as climate change. Many of the air pollutants like ozone, volatile organic compounds are also greenhouse gases. And even the solid pollutants like black carbon also contribute to heat trapping. The second is unhealthy diet in the population. It includes the preference for agriculturally intensive and less healthy meat products over unprocessed plant-based diets. So being agriculturally intensive means there's a lot of requirement for water, for land, and energy to produce, giving off more emissions. And lastly, physical inactivity is closely tied with the reliance on cars and other easy modes of transportation that usually have diesel or gasoline as fuel source, when we could be walking and biking more. In summary, the common pathway by which these NCD risk factors contribute to climate change is through an increase in greenhouse gas emissions across different sectors that include energy, transportation, and food and agriculture. Now, another source of interconnectedness is that the issues of NCDs and climate change are both partly attributed to rapid urbanization and population growth. 
With these two together, there's increased demand for energy sources, there's increased demand for, there's urban sprawl or when the development spreads outside the city centers and increased dependence on automobiles with increased exhaust emissions. But what I will be discussing for the rest of my presentation is this, the middle part of the slide, which is how climate change affects NCDs. And I've also included here related conditions such as heat related illnesses and undernutrition. Now, before I leave this slide, I just wanna mention that this figure is not intended to be comprehensive, but it gives us a general picture of how allowing NCD risk factors to perpetuate harms both planetary and human health. Now, the main pathway by which climate change exerts its effect on health, is through its bidirectional interaction with air pollution. The link becomes even stronger when we think that the risk factors that drive climate change, like energy use, population growth, increased food demands, are exactly the same forces that drive air pollution. So aside from releasing greenhouse gases that lead to climate change, these activities release other pollutants, specifically particulate matter, that dirty the air that we breathe and cause disease. Now, air pollution may arise from natural sources, such as when volcanoes erupt, like what's happening right now in one of our volcanoes here in the Philippines, or from man-made sources, which can be area sources during open waste burning. And this is quite you know, um, commonly done in the provinces here in the Philippines. Stationary sources from manufacturing facilities, power plants, or mobile sources generated by cars, buses, and the planes. Air pollutants can also be classified as primary, meaning they are emitted directly into the atmosphere, like carbon dioxide, or secondary as a result of reactions between primary pollutants. For example, in this picture on the right, nitrogen oxide and volatile organic compounds to produce ozone in the presence of sunlight. So ozone now is a secondary air pollutant. Air pollutants can also exist as solid liquid particles or what we call particulate matter or in gaseous form. For example, ozone, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and the volatile organic compounds. But a more important distinction for us clinicians is the size of particulate matter. Coarse PM or PM10 are the bigger size pollutants with a size range of 2.5 to 10 micrometers. Now, going down the spectrum on the left are the smaller pollutants, known as fine or PM2.5 and ultra-fine particulate matter. The figure on the right illustrates just how small these particles are in relation to a strand of hair. Black carbon, or what we know as soot, is an important component of PM2.5. But why is the size of particulate matter important? Now, let's look at the figure on top first. Coarse PM or PM10, because they're big, they tend to deposit mostly in the upper airways. And usually the effect is just irritation of the airways, manifesting as sneezing, runny nose, scratchy throat, cough, or probably mucus production because there's impaired ciliary function because of the local inflammation. However, as the particles get smaller, starting from PM2.5, the further down the bronchial tree they can travel. And the smallest of particles can reach the alveoli, cross the alveolocapillary membrane, and diffuse in the bloodstream. Now, the systemic effects of air pollution can occur via two main, oftentimes co-occurring pathways, through oxidative stress or through the inflammatory response, ultimately resulting in damage to the basic building blocks of the body or disruption in its normal functioning and or cell death. These are the proposed mechanisms that explain why people may develop emphysema, atherosclerosis, cancers when exposed to air pollution in the long term. And the same thing can happen with gaseous pollutants. They can result in mild symptoms or be absorbed by the body when exposed to high concentrations or for long periods of time, resulting in systemic effects. Now, these are the different conditions that may result from exposure to air pollution. As I mentioned, pollutants may be absorbed by the body, so the resp response can be systemic and practically every organ of the body can be affected. Now, research is con still continually uncovering just how extensive the impact of air pollution is. 
Right now, there are those diseases and conditions that have been identified as strongly associated, like all-cause mortality, COPD, pneumonia, stroke, ischemic heart disease, and those that are suggestive and need more studies to confirm. But a useful guide for us to remember is, the likelihood of experiencing health effects from air pollution depends on these factors. One is the current health status of the individual. Is the patient healthy or does he belong to an at-risk population? At-risk meaning very old, very young, pregnant, with coexisting lung disease like asthma or COPD or coexisting heart disease, because these patients are the ones more likely to experience health effects. Next, we also consider the pollutant type and concentration. There are different thresholds of exposure for every pollutant. And lastly, the length of exposure to polluted air. So acute exposures, they usually result in temporary and mild symptoms, like maybe eye, eye irritation, cough, throat clearing in healthy individuals. But again, if you're at risk, this can lead to a worsening of your baseline condition that can lead to urgent consults, admissions, and a faster progression of your disease. Now, while for the chronic exposure, its role is more on the development of disease with longer onset, like cardiovascular diseases, COPD, and cancer. This is a summary of the different air pollutants and cert their certain characteristics. On the fourth column, we see that only two out of the nine pollutants do not have an impact on health. And just to circle back to our earlier discussion on air pollution and climate change, the third column tells us which ones among them have a climate impact. So most contribute to warming. Some have mixed warming and cooling effects. And only one, sulfur dioxide, has a poorly cooling effect. But that still doesn't mean it's not hazardous as an air pollutant. So that's the gas being extruded from erupting volcanoes that harms health and causes acid rain. This figure provides us with the details regarding the, bidire the bidirectional arrow between air pollution and climate change, change that I showed a few slides back. So like I said in the last slide, some air pollutants are also greenhouse gases and contribute to global warming. So a warmer earth, on the other hand, makes air pollution worse because warm conditions, they promote the formation of more ozone because remember the chemical reaction to form ozone occurs in the presence of sunlight while drier conditions cause particles to be suspended longer in an area instead of naturally falling and depositing on the ground if it's covered by moisture particles. But of course, let's remember that this is a simplified view of the interaction. There are of course a lot more atmospheric and meteorological factors at play, and in reality, the interaction is quite complex. So my apologies, um, this is quite a busy slide, but it summarizes for us the other ways, aside from air pollution, by which climate change contributes to NCDs, heat-related illnesses, and undernutrition. First, we know that most human diseases are multifactorial in origin. So we're not saying that climate change is the cause or the sole factor operating here, but it does contribute, and these are the mechanisms by which it can do that. For example, the more frequent and increased intensity of heat extremes can lead to heat stress, and the body reacts with an increase in core temperature, increase in heart rates, sweating, eventually leading to varying degrees of heat-related illnesses like heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. There's also an increase in CVD and respiratory disease, especially exacerbations of existing conditions. Now, when these losses are not replaced adequately, the resulting dehydration contributes to stone formation in the kidneys, as well as electrolyte imbalance. Now, in increased temperatures and less rainfall increase the production of ozone, which can cause upper respiratory tract symptoms that are actually non-infectious in origin, as well as exacerbations of cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. Because of the lack of rainfall, Pollen and spores, they get suspended in the air for longer periods of time and can cause allergic symptoms for more people. On the other hand, um, if, if you look at the middle of the slide, there are some diseases that may benefit with the thinning of the ozone layer. 
Higher lifetime exposure to sunlight, for example, lowers the risk of developing multiple sclerosis. Now, for countries that are very, very cold and where people can die because of cold-related causes, an increase in their temperature during winter because of global warming will be beneficial to them and cold-related deaths may decrease. Next is drought and flooding. These can result in reduced crop yields and food and nutrition insecurity that result in undernutrition. It's also worth noting that staple crops like rice and wheat become less nutritious when exposed to very high carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. These crops would lack the essential nutrients like zinc and iron. And lastly, at the very bottom, I included here extreme weather events like fires, flooding, hurricanes, and their social impacts, specifically the disruption in an infrastructure, the disruption in the delivery of health services, shortage of, shortage of drugs, and impoverishment, all of which affect how we detect and manage NCDs. So these disturbances can result in delayed diagnosis of patients, uncontrolled chronic conditions, and worse prognosis for them. So as you can see, the impacts of global climate change on human health are diverse. Some are positive, but they're mostly negative. As we have seen, gone are the days when we can think of climate change as just an environment issue. But in as much as we see it as a threat to human health, it also presents us, the health sector, with opportunities to improve health through climate change mitigation and adaptation. But why the health sector? The first reason is the health sector is responsible for almost 5% of global greenhouse gas emissions because we are heavily reliant on fossil fuel as our energy source. Now, majority of our footprint comes from the supply chain, from the production, transport, and disposal of goods and services, such as the drugs, the medical devices, the hospital equipment, the PPEs that we use. The rest are from emissions produced by our healthcare facilities and vehicles. And the last is purchased energy sources like electricity. So for the health sector, especially us physicians, Let's be reminded to first do no harm. The healthcare industry, we need to do more to address climate change than just treat its victims. But the second reason is we are powerful agents of change for many reasons. We are highly trusted sources of information. We are trained in communicating complex health information to patients and we interact with diverse patients and communities. And lastly, we have health as our agenda and health is a universal concern. We can be effective not only in spreading messages on climate health, but also in advocating for better decisions by leaders. Now, sorry, those animations are not working. That's why you can't see what's beneath this picture. But I listed some of the concrete ways to help us fulfill our role. For individuals, we educate ourselves on the health repercussions of climate change. We should be sensitized to the health impacts of climate change on our patients. Two, we advocate for government climate action that reduces airborne pollutants and car dependency. Three, let's lead by example in our community. Let's model the same behaviors we ask of our patients by choosing to walk and uh, walk, take the stairs going up instead of using the elevator. And we consider telemedicine when possible to limit the need for travel both for the patient and the doctor. Also consider shifting to paperless systems in our clinics, all to cut workplace emissions when we can. For professional societies, and this is what I'm flashing here, when we give practice recommendations to our members, let's try to consider the climate impact of those recommendations. For example, anesthesia is a very carbon intensive, intensive specialty because they use inhalational gases that are potent greenhouse gases. The American Society of Anesthesiologists came up with this guidance to avoid inhaled anesthetics with a high climate impact, specifically desflurane and nitrous oxide, aside from desflurane being very expensive. So these are steps that we can take to help in fighting climate change. Next, we actively promote health at the patient level by encouraging active transport, such as walking, biking, and reducing red meat consumption. So what benefits health benefits the climate as well. And if you're inclined to research, engage in research to conduct evidence-based analysis and estimates of health and climate co-benefits. Now, as health institutions, 
let's try to develop sustainable policies to fight climate change, start the transition to renewable energy like solar, incorporate green building and smart landscaping into hospital design, so that one effect of that is we use natural light and we reduce our, our reliance on electricity. And lastly, since we cannot really avoid hazardous events and disturbances as an effect of climate change, we need to build sustainable and more resilient healthcare systems, one that anticipates the impact of natural disasters on our healthcare system and knows how to adapt and cope with the consequences of these. So the World Health Organization has an operational framework for this. I end my presentation with these key messages. MCDs are a major contributor to the global burden of disease, and there's inter interdependency of climate change, air pollution, and NCDs. These linkages create as much an opportunity as a threat for us, and interventions to combat climate change present key opportunities to effectively address NCDs. And lastly, the health sector has a critical role to play in climate change mitigation and adaptation. So that's my last slide. Thank you for your attention. My apologies again for the technical glitch earlier. Thank you very much, Dr. Lalas. Uh, maybe you can turn on your camera and unshare your uh, slides so we can proceed to uh, uh, a more interactive uh, conversation and uh, Q&A. So today, or this today, we learned more about the general linkages between climate change and NCDs. Um, I'm particularly, um, you know, struck by one comment that you said that, you know, climate change is not really going to create a lot of these NCG, NCDs anew, but they will be exacerbating, you know, existing or present non-communicable diseases. For instance, um, you know, the ones that you mentioned, uh, cardiorespiratory disease resulting from air pollution, uh, et cetera. And then you gave some really important pointers as to what health professionals can do later, uh, even in their own specialty societies, calling for climate action, uh, et, uh, et cetera. And I'm reading one comment. My takeaway is that the health sector has a pivotal role to play in addressing climate change. I think that is, you know, the, the key message for this entire course. Uh, and, and you will be realizing and hearing it again and again until the very end of this uh, eight session uh, course. So any other, any questions or comments from our participants? Okay, we have one hand that is being raised. Do you do you want to ask your question uh, verbally? Uh, we can unmute your mic. Okay, we have a few hands being raised. So maybe we can do make this more interactive uh, rather than I reading the questions uh, in the chat box. So let's have Sheba first, and then Maureen, and then Robert. Sheba. I'll I'll un unmute you now. Uh, hi, Prof. I think when we are talking about the uh, non-communicable diseases and the climate change, I think one thing we should talk maybe about the mental health issues also. <coughs> mental Hi. health. Yeah, because I think Sorry. Ah, mental health, yes. Yeah, I got yeah. that. Mental health. Yes, I didn't cover mental health here because I understand it's going to be in one in the succeeding sessions. But yeah, I agree that yes, climate change also has an impact on that. Uh, I think poor air quality can lead to depression and anxiety yes. and even extremes of temperature can yes. lead to violent behavior and commitment of crimes. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you for that. Thank you so much, Sheba. And next week, we also have a session dedicated to mental health, the impacts of climate change on mental health. So please uh, join us again. Make sure you will be there. 
Uh, but also in connection to air pollution, yes, as already have discussed, it also ha has its own uh, linkage to mental health uh, problems, to cognitive development, uh, so on and so forth. Let's have Maureen. And uh, Dr. Lalas, I wonder if we can unshare the screen because it shows Hello. the I'm slide with your face. Yep. Oh, Marine, I, I, please. Okay. I don't know how to unshare it because I didn't share it the usual way. That's okay. Why, I'm sorry. I don't know. How. Maybe, maybe you can just remove. Yeah, you can just remove me as host so I can stop sharing automatically. Yep. So what I'm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay, you. Okay, good. Uh, let's have Maureen. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Um, I'm just uh, not clear on the intersection of uh, climate change and Nanego communicable disease. Uh, I want to have that clear uh, relationship. How does climate change like uh, lead to Nanego communicable disease? Because what I have in my mind, I, I have uh, diabetes like in mind. So can you please clarify on that one? Thank you. Okay, so like I said, um, um, I mentioned in the slide, no, this there is this bidirectional interaction between climate change and air pollution, and it's basically the it's basically the main pathway by which it can exert its health effects. However, um, regarding the question on the concern for diabetes specifically, well, for this, may, the studies are not quite very clear yet. It's really more of the cardiorespiratory diseases and the cancers that you know, we can more or less trace how it's actually causing those diseases. But some diseases are less established than the others. So I hope, yeah, that answers the question. Thank you. And, and that's uh, an, an, an arena for further research. Yes. So if you are a health researcher, uh, it will be great if you can uh, take a look at uh, the potential uh, pathways that link climate change and these other non-communicable diseases. Of course, one other link is when, for example, uh, an extreme weather event happens and you destroy health facilities, um, supply chains of insulin get disrupted, then diabetes care mm -hmm. becomes yes. affected. So it's not a direct relationship, mm -hmm. you know, that climate change leads to non-communicable diseases, but the care for the NCDs uh -huh. become uh, disrupted and, and affected. And that is a more indirect linkage uh, yeah. between climate change and, and, and uh, non-communicable diseases. Thank you, Maureen. Let's have Robert. I think I promised Robert first and then Michelle. And then I'll ask the questions in the chat box. Thank you very much. My name is Robert uh, from Nairobi, Kenya. So my, my question will be will be around uh, availability of data uh, mm -hmm. to show the intersection between climate change and health. Uh, it is a yeah. it is a relatively new discussion that is happening, mm -hmm. and uh, when you try to reach to policymakers in regard mm -hmm. to how do we uh, find ways of countering the effects of climate on health or including climate change on health issues, they usually require data so that they mm -hmm. can show we can show them the evidence like how worse is it becoming how better is it uh, is it becoming with the interventions of other partners so my question will be in south in in asia for example do you have availability of data that really shows how climate change has an effect on health that's okay. my question thank you very much for the presentation though okay well in general Studies, you know, directly, those directly studying climate change and health would be very challenging to conduct because you would have to monitor the population, the health of the population over a longer period of time. And, you know, um, and you would have to correlate it based on the observed trends in the climate. So you have to consider other factors as well because during that time you're monitoring them, there's go going to be a lot of social and environment social and environmental um, variations so it will be quite hard actually to establish that direct link but what i can suggest is to go through that air pollution health pathway because that is more um that is more 
let's say feasible or that's more um probably more plausible for us to conduct that is that link between air pollution and health especially knowing that air pollution is the main pathway by which climate change actually exerts its effect on health because there's always that challenge conducting these studies especially over you know large populations and for so long would be very challenging it's very complex to conduct Thank you very much for that question. Um, in fact, we have another colleague, uh, you know, sharing an article about how does pollution lead to diabetes. So, so it's not climate change per se, but uh, pollution. And I think in terms of environmental toxicants, etc., there's some work already happening uh, linking NCDs. I think what we also should remember is that. Climate change, um, it was described actually in several papers in this manner. Climate change is a threat multiplier. Again, echoing what we just discussed a while ago, these conditions are already existing, but climate change is going to exacerbate, worsen, uh, make it more difficult for the health sector and the health professionals to address them. So it's very important for us to, to have some idea of the linkages both direct and indirect, and both known, but also potential, right? Yeah. And I'm emphasizing the potential because, again, there is a need for more research. Um, so thank you for that question. I'll call Michelle, and then, you know, I'm seeing Yeshwana, Yeshwan, who has a question in the chat box, but maybe um, Yeshwan wants to ask it verbally as well. So Michelle and then Yeshwan. And then I'll try to read some of the questions in the chat box as well. Michelle, Hi, you're yeah. unmuted now. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Dr. Lalas, thank you so much. That was a very informative presentation. Um, my question is in regard to, you mentioned an option like for anesthesia. Yeah. Um, how will hospitals or let's say businesses uh, adapt to it? Are these actually applicable? Because the bottom line for businesses is actually uh, the cost benefit of it. Um, so that's one of my questions. The next is, I think we all need to consider and actually accept that climate change and being health responders, it's interconnected. Because we're all in the earth, so we're all going to be um, tackling what climate change will bring us as health workers as well. So thank you, doctor. That's my uh, just one question and my follow-up opinion. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that. No, but re regarding the first question on the on how it will actually affect no, the cost in terms of the in terms of the revenue in hospitals. Well, I guess that's why it's important that even health institutions. Are, are well well aware of this problem so they, that they can be part of the solution so that even though you know it will it will cost them in the in the cost them from a revenue perspective they would still choose to take the you know higher ground and still choose to you know participate in the fight against climate change I mean, there are going to be other means by which they can, you know, gain back that revenue. But I think what's really important is for them to, for us to be able to educate every, every, every part of this of the healthcare sector, so that we can be aligned in our goals of, of fighting climate change. Because really, there's going to be, you know, some people who are going to lose from this. But you know, if we're able to communicate it very clearly, how important this is, and that how important it is for everyone to act to solve the problem, then hopefully we can gain a following from there. So thank you. Yep. Well, let me just add, no? thanks, uh, Miriam, for your uh, response. Uh, and, and this is always the difficult question, you know, when, when someone asks about cost, is this going to be costly? Will the hospital not be earning a lot anymore, right? Will, will it affect our uh, revenue? Um, and one, this is again another arena for research. You know, mm -hmm. there are colleagues who are working on the cost and how to keep these interventions cost effective, you know, that we are able to achieve our health outcomes or desired outcomes, but at the same time, 
you know, not making it too expensive or unaffordable. Uh, but also another uh, perspective is that, you know, when you start incorporating these, uh, you know, thinking about the long term, you know, that we're not just concerned about the bottom line, but we're concerned about the future sustainability of the planet, you know, and the future children uh, who will be affected, then the discussion becomes, uh, you know, a, a bit a bit more different, right? Um, and and uh, uh, we may want to start looking at the situation at a much, you know, from a much broader view rather than this very narrow view. It's all about money, right? It's all about, you know, the costs now, and we're not concerned about the costs for future generations, right? The the lost lives, the lost opportunities, because climate change is going to to worsen as a result of our inaction today. Uh, of course, this is quite challenging to to imagine, right? And that's why uh, we need to have more of these discussions to sensitize the health sector. That you know, we're not just concerned about uh, you know the the financial aspect, which is more present day, but we're also thinking about future generations and and maybe the uh, slight uh, loss in income now will actually be beneficial in the long run right because more people will be healthy you know our future generations will be healthy there will be a healthy planet to uh leave behind uh the next generation so um and and i think that should be part of our healing mission you know uh unfortunately our sector has become more I would say profit oriented, and we forgot about the resp our responsibility to people and planet. Um, and then there was a, you know, I think one question was also about anesthetic gases, right? Uh, but but uh, you know, now I'm reminded another product that we use in healthcare a lot that has also uh, carbon emitting potential is inhalers, yeah. which you as a pulmonologist also do prescribe to patients. Any thoughts on the future of the inhaler or asthma management, uh, given that some inhalers are seen to be or are, are already established to be contributing to the climate change problem as well? Well, actually, there is that option for the, for the meter dose inhalers. Those are the kinds of inhalers that have a, um, the propellant that are actually um, greenhouse gases, hydrofluorocarbons. But there are those kinds of inhalers that are also metered dose inhalers, but they actually contain less of that propellant or a different kind of propellant such that the emissions is less. And they found that this is actually a better option for patients rather than shifting them to the dry powder inhaler. So yeah, I, I encountered that, but I did look at whether there's like a similar statement from, you know, pulmonary societies, similar to what the anesthesia society in America has given. Uh, so far, there's none. Mm -hmm. But because I think there's the emissions from that is still is not very significant. But still, it, it will add up, you know, if you know, if we continuously prescribe it, many people are using it will eventually add up. And the point here really is to reduce. So it's not really about a lot. Um, it's not just about Elimination. Yeah, it's just, yeah. just about limitation because in the greater scheme of things, it's going to pile up. Right. And and maybe in session five or session six, rather, when we talk about sustainable healthcare mitigation strategies, we can have more discussions on how do we balance these different considerations, right? We want to reduce our carbon footprint, but some healthcare services or procedures or commodities will still be needed because, you know, our sector made a commitment to, you know, treat patients as well. So, so you know, I would love to hear more thoughts and, 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 and even stimulate debate. But this is the thing. What's important is that we're now talking about these things. Before, you know, we're, we're doing healthcare, we're providing healthcare, we're making healthcare decisions as if climate change does not exist. Yeah. But now it becomes part of the equation and of course, it's not an easy discussion to have, but it's an important discussion to have nonetheless. I'm seeing some interesting comments and even people sharing references about, you know, <laughs> anesthetic uh, transformation in, you know, the OR leading to even savings in costs. 
effects, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's not impossible to actually be both uh, healthy for the planet and also healthy for our pockets. Uh, and then we are seeing some papers also being shared regarding air pollution and insulin resistance. So what I'm really appreciating here is that our co-learners are now doing their research, right? Homework, Google searching. They're starting to be interested in these uh, you know, emerging topics that we probably have not encountered when we were still in medical school, nursing school, uh, in any health profession school. I've been making Yeshwan wait for several minutes now. Yeshwan, why don't you uh, ask your question now? Uh, thanks, Professor Guento. Uh, thank you for the session. Very insightful and uh, interesting. So my question is uh, similar to what I've already asked in the chat box. Uh, has there been any attempts to include the climate change related activities in the LNCD policies or programs? Uh, especially in the context of LMICs, because that's where most of the death occur. Uh, I'm not looking at maybe, you know, large scale program, but uh, maybe a pilot or a, maybe a, a local government or a regional government led policy, which is looking at a specific disease or a group of NCDs and uh, including that in the policies or programs in your experience. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Yeshwant. And I just want to, because we have also limited time, I'm trying to combine questions now. Uh, Victoria Molina, who is from the University of the Philippines College of Public Health, is also asking, how can local government units prepare for the impacts of climate change while also addressing the increasing prevalence of NCD? So it's like we now have two problems. And of course, in the real world, we have multiple problems happening at the same time. So I guess both questions talk about how can we integrate the two agendas much, much more closer to each other. Miriam? Okay, well, for the first question, in terms of the the policies at the local or um, regional level, um, well, I'm afraid I can't answer that one. I'm not really, at, at least in the Philippines. So far, I, I haven't seen, you know, um, uh, making that link, um, promoting um, climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation in the context of health. Although, just recently, you know, we're starting these initiatives to um, to make it uh, make the health the health part more visible in the discussions on climate change. Now, the other question is in terms of the local government units, right? On how they can make it more, how can how they can make their healthcare systems more um, sustainable or, or climate resilient. Um, so, yeah, but, but in particular. NCDs, NCD control and prevention, uh -huh. and climate and addressing climate change. Is there a way that the two can oh. actually be linked in in practice? Okay. Oh yes, uh, definitely. Um, for example, no. Um, when we are anticipating, um, when we are anticipating certain weather events. For example, in the presence for right now, we have volcanic eruptions like down south here in the Philippines. Because of that, we know there's going to be there's going to be a rise in NCDs or an exacerbation of these chronic diseases. So it's very important that we're able to collaborate to communicate with the local governments. The health sector is able to communicate with the local health gov uh, with the local governments in terms of protecting the people from the ex from exposure to volcanic um to volcanic gas and volcanic ash. So that's one way that we can you know, actually anticipate the rise of NCDs and exacerbations of these diseases, knowing how climate can, how, you know, um, how they can be affected by climate. Thank you very much, uh, Miriam. Uh, well, just to add to that uh, climate change and NCD link and how can we translate that into policy and practice, I can think of at least three arenas. So, so number one, we want to prevent the NCDs from happening in the first place. Uh, and we know that climate change, as already discussed a while ago by Dr. Miriam, is contributing, not directly causing. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for some NCDs, there might be some causal relationship, but in, in general, driving the, the spread and the emergence of NCDs. So we need to come up with preventive solutions or policies. So for example, uh, improving air quality, right? And 
cutting our carbon addiction, you know, our mm -hmm. emissions, our, our fossil fuel burning leading to carbon emissions. Uh, a while ago, there was a colleague uh, who shared uh, an article that I actually co-wrote uh, in the British Medical Journal about addressing the food system, because that is also mm -hmm. another sector that contributes both to climate change and to NCDs. You know, our food systems are making us uh, fat and uh, and and obese, and and that needs to be addressed as well. So one is on the prevention side. I think number two is in the care side. You know, there are people with NCDs already. Uh, we discussed a while ago about um, uh, disruptions in the provision of NCD care, whether you have diabetes or hypertension, but there's no uh, medicine supply available because the health facility was wiped out. So that is another link. And we need to make sure NCD care continues even in the face of uh, climate emergency. Um, and then more research on the areas that we know little about, right? So our colleagues, our co-learners were asking questions about, oh, is there a link between climate change and diabetes? Is there a link between X and Y? You know, uh, Right now, another emerging area is uh, the impact of heat on health. So that is not an infectious disease. That's a non-communicable disease uh, brought about by exposure to extreme heat. And that is an area where there is very little scholarship happening, uh, for example, in the Philippines or in Southeast Asia. And so we need to be studying more those uh, emerging health issues related to climate change. So those are some areas where there's potential um, you know, application and translation of uh, the climate and see these links in prevention, in care, and in understanding uh, the less known impacts. Sandy, I'm seeing your hand. Please feel free to ask your question. And then, and then I will be reading some quick comments and questions in the chat box, and then uh, we'll wrap up the session. Sandy? Okay, so since we're not hearing from Sandy, let me just... Uh... Yes, can you hear okay. me? Yes, we Hi. can hear you, please. Thanks, from the Bahamas. Um, good presentation, Dr. Miriam. My question actually was, um, people experiencing PTSD, um, post-traumatic stress syndrome in climate change or extreme weather. Yep. Well, Dr. Sandy, the session... In, on Tuesday next week is about mental health. So we have a dedicated session on mental health because we understand more and more people now, including health professionals, are recognizing that climate change is not just a physical health issue, it's also a mental health issue. So I wonder if we can reserve that question on PTSD for our Tuesday webinar or future Tuesday session. Thank you for understanding. Um, and then let me just look at some of the questions. Well, um, we, we do not have any more time because we have two clinical cases. Remember in the previous session, we showed to you two uh, doctor-patient interviews. And I really appreciate the comments that we were receiving since uh, the last session. People were not only happy about the technical content of those uh, interviews, those simulations, they were also quite uh, thrilled about the nature of the doctor-patient interview. And I hope that we will also learn and, and, and um, you know, carry those uh, uh, insights, those uh, practical skills into our, um, you know, our practice of our healing mission, as I mentioned a while ago, thanks to the one who uh, liked that uh, phrase. And uh, I appreciate also one of our co-learners trying to also summarize what we've been discussing. So this is a very interactive class Zoom, right? Uh, not a passive one. And uh, thank you everybody for your comments and insights. Any last words, Dr. Miriam, before we uh, proceed to the next section? Uh, no more than that, last words for me. Thank you very much for listening and thank you for your questions. And thank you, Miriam. We'll work together in the in we'll work more together in creating a healthy people on a healthy planet. Okay, so there you have it. We already finished our first segment, which is the lecture.
And as again, you are aware, we will be presenting two clinical cases. Uh, and we would love to hear your uh, thoughts in the chat box. What do you think is the climate sensitive, non-communicable disease that is being uh, diagnosed, managed uh, in that uh, clinical encounter? And then of course, after the two sessions, we will be hearing a synthesis so that we will be learning not only about the clinical pearls, but also the public health pearls. What do we do as a health sector to address uh, you know, the impacts of climate change on non-communicable diseases. So can we have now our first uh, doctor-patient interview? Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third case of the course. Those who will be presenting the session today include myself, Dr. Ali Esmile, Mr. Hans Ansho, and Dr. Tyron Tobias. The clinical case today is about Topo Magdayal. He is a 62-year-old male. Height is 166 centimeters. Weight is, is 55 kilograms. And BMI is 20. Toto is a 62-year-old fisherman who lives in Kipilimbok, Aurora, Philippines, a rural coastal town. He was brought back home by his son after Toto complained of severe dizziness and numbness in his right, on his right arm. Alarmed by the sudden dizziness and numbness, Toto and his son decided to head back to the shore. Once at home, Toto's wife may bathe in water and massage liniment on his numb arms. Even after resting inside their shaded hut, May noticed that Toto's body was still very warm, as though he had a fever. He continued to complain of dizziness and numbness. Given his continued confusion, since Toto was not feeling better, May decided to bring him to the nearby room. For today's session, the patient will be played by Mr. Hans Asho, and I will play as the doctor. Good morning, sir. I'm Dr. De La Cruz. May I ask you for your name? Good morning. Um, I am Toto. Uh, can I ask what brings you to the health center today? I, I don't feel good. I was fishing and then suddenly I got busy. Oh, can you tell me more? Aside from the dizziness, what happened? What else happened? It was at sea. It was a good day. The sea was calm. The waves were small. I was on my boat and suddenly I got dizzy. I tried to pull the net, but I couldn't lift my arm. I I've been fishing for 15 years, and this has never happened before. My son decided to go home early because I could not fish. Has something similar happened in the past? This is the first time I got busy. Sometimes I would get a headache towards the end of my day. Sometimes I would remember fainting while fishing. How how often do you think? I think one to two times. Not often. And how long has this been happening, the episodes of painting and headache? After the cool bear months, December. I think last month in March. Uh, how long is one painting episode usually? A few minutes. I don't really know. My son would just wake me up and he realizes I paint. Can you describe the symptoms? Which part of your head hurts? Here. It hurts here. I, I can still fish, but I need to sleep it off when I get I see. So just one part of your head, one side only. Yeah. Uh, and the dizziness, do you feel pain in your arm? I, 
I still feel like I'm on the boat. Mm -hmm. I don't feel any pain. I don't feel anything on my arm. Have you done anything to make yourself better or worse? I, I drink water. It's the same. My wife massages my arm. I don't feel it. I don't sleep, the headache doesn't go away. And what happens if you try to cool yourself off with a cold towel? I, I would never do that. I would get pasma. If it's hot outside, I just let myself sweat. I don't drink cold water or use a cold towel when it's hot because it's bad for the health. It's pasma. I understand. Um, any other symptoms that you noticed, like vomiting? Did you notice anything different with your urine? No. What do you do to treat the symptoms? Do you also self-medicate? I, I just sleep and drink water. Do you have any illnesses or are you taking any maintenance medication? The doctor before told me I have high blood pressure. So I've been taking medication since then. Uh, what kind of medications? I drink this medicine that would make me pee often. I Do you know the name? Hydrochlor... Hydrochlorothiazide. Yes. Around 12.5 milligrams. I think so. That one, yes. I take that twice a day. Okay. How long have you been taking these medications? Five years. Five years ago. And no other medications with it? Just, just that? Just that one. All right. Are you being treated for any mental health condition? No. And any surgeries in the past? Never. May I ask who, who, who you live with? I live with my family, my wife, my mother, and my five kids. All right. Do you smoke or drink alcohol? If yes, how much and how often? I, I don't smoke, but I drink a bottle of beer with my neighbors every weekend. Do you use cannabis or illicit drugs? No, no, I don't do that. And among your colleagues, others with similar symptoms? My, my neighbor, I think, also gets the same headaches. And he's also a fisherman. Like I see. Can you tell me more about your work? So... We prepare the boat around 3 a.m. when it's still dark outside and then fish until 9 a.m. or later, depending on the catch. We take a break at noon because it gets very hot. We go back around early afternoon, around 3 to 5 p.m. And what's your living situation? Do you have aircon at home or electric fan? I live by the shore, so we feel the ocean breeze, but it gets very hot at a late morning. We don't have stable electricity, but our house is made of bamboo, so it's not hot inside. Uh, we use also water pump for our water supply. I see. So Toto, thank you for sharing all that information. We will now proceed to the physical exam. May I request you to proceed to the examination room? Okay. Thank you, Doc. Thank you.
For the physical examination, patient was so in mildly anxious, flushed in appearance. Vital signs were 38.5 degrees Celsius for the temperature. Blood pressure was 165 over 70 millimeter mercury. Pulse rate was 130 beats per minute, regular, weak pulse. Respiration rate was 22 cycles per minute. Skin was cool, pale, clammy, no rashes, no pedicure, no signs of trauma or bruising. For the head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat, patient had anesthetic spray, pale palpebral tension pulva, dry oil, nipple smelling, pupils were 7 millimeters, normal posterior oil parents, neck supple, no cervical lymphadenopathy. For the cardiovascular exam, patient had a dynamic tachycardic, tachycardic, regular rhythm. Patient was tachycardic with regular rhythm, no murmurs, rubs, or gallops, and, weak, and had weak distal pulses. For the pulmonary exam, patient was tachycardic with symmetric chest expansion, no retractions, and clear bed sounds bilaterally. For the GI, there was no abdominal distension, no tenderness, the abdomen was soft, firm, with regular liver edge, and no screaming agony. For the neuro exam, patient was fully alert and oriented to person, place, and time, and all three neural nerves were intact. For the musculoskeletal exam, strength was 5 over 5, and sensation was intact to light touch. Patient had normal reflexes, full range of motion at all joints, and no, and no joint swelling. For the psych exam, patient had delayed response, no hallucinations, and no delusions, and was occasionally conventional. For the salient features, patient was a 62-year-old male, fisherman, who lives at Sitio Limbok, Aurora, Philippines, a rural coastal town. And his chief complaint, again, was severe dizziness and numbness of the right arm. Other symptoms include confusion, episodes of fainting, and heartache. And on the right, we can see the difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Our patient had dizziness, cool, pale, clammy skin, nausea or vomiting, and rapid weak pulse. For patients who are suspected to have heat exhaustion, it's better to get them to a cooler and air-conditioned place if possible. Um, drink water if fully conscious and take a full shower or um, apply cold compresses. And for heat stroke, for suspected heat stroke patients, it can, they can have problem headaches, no sweating, um, increased body temperature, muscular or vomiting also, and rapid strong pulse. And, and heat stroke patients may lose, con lose consciousness. With this, heat stroke is an it's a medical emergency, so it's better to call an ambulance immediately and take immediate action to pull the person until their help arrives. So next, we will work up the patient with a CT scan to check for infarct or hemorrhage, check the complete blood count, blood sugar, chemistry, such as electrolytes, blood cultures, urine cultures, and urinalysis. We will also do a TSH to check the thyroid and consider EKG to rule out electrical abnormalities. And for the management, patient is advised to be admitted to the hospital. And then ice packs are supposed to be applied on the armpit and the groin area. And other evaporative cooling measures should also be taken. And uh, lastly, IV fluid replacement is advised and nausea management if needed. Thank you for listening. So that is the first uh, case, and I'm seeing our co-learners already writing their uh, their working impression. Okay, initially they were writing uh, some other uh, potential, uh, you know, diagnosis, and then as the case becomes clearer and clearer, uh, there's a, a convergence around a particular okay. climate sensitive uh, condition. So now let's hear the second uh, case. Let's play the video.
there's no sound. Can we restart, please? Thank you. Today, now we're going to talk about the case of Riza Makarim, a six-year-old male living in a port district in Jakarta, Indonesia. He presents with three days of cough and difficulty of sleeping. Uh, he also has difficulty breathing during summer. His cough and breathing improve when indoors, when using an inhaler, and when given jamu. The reason for his consult is persistent coughing and heavy breathing. The patient's demeanor is that he is not talking much. He appears agitated and tired. He has moderately labored breathing and is clinging to his mom. Uh, the consult occurs at the health center in Jakarta, Indonesia. Hi, Riza. Hi, Dara. My name is Dr. Sebalios. How can I help you today? Hello, doctor. It's my son. He has been having trouble breathing, especially since last night. I gave him jamu, but it doesn't make him any better. I asked him to stay at home so the dirty air doesn't bother him. But his breathing is just getting worse. Okay. It's good to know that you brought him to the clinic. Did you notice that he's also coughing? Yes. He is tired from constantly coughing. He can't sleep properly because he coughs even more at night. So he's been tired and not as active. I honestly think it's the air in this town. Even though we're not required to wear masks anymore, I still make sure that we do because the air feels so dirty. Especially this summer, his coughing and his breathing sometimes sounds like a whistle. It's much worse. And for the past three days, he's really been having a hard time breathing. Mm, a whistle? Uh, like this whistling from his lungs, from his chest? From his breathing. His breathing. I hear... I Okay, okay. So he has cough and he has difficulty breathing. Uh, you mentioned that it gets worse in summer. Do you notice if generally he coughs more when it's hotter? I think so. Because when this heat wave started four days ago, he's been coughing a lot more, especially when I walk into school. And then the day after, his cough got even worse, so I made him stay at home. Mm, okay, so he's been missing school also. Um, has he ever had this kind of cough before? Yes. I think when he was around three to five years old, he would always have this dry cough and the whistling whenever he got sick. There was even a time when he was four years old that I had to take him several times to the emergency room. Okay. Do you remember what they gave to him at the emergency room? I remember that we stayed for a few hours so he could use this machine where he inhaled some something like steam. A uh, nebulizer? Does yes. it sound like a nebulizer? Yes, I okay. think that is. Okay, um, but before his cough got worse, did he always have a cough? Like in a week, would you say that there are days when he doesn't cough at all? I'm not sure. I think he's always been coughing. But his cough is dry, you know, when there's no phlegm. No phlegm. Okay. Okay. Uh, and he also mentioned that he's not been getting enough sleep. Has it always been the case? No, he slept a lot before. But since this month, he didn't have any sleep for like, I think, once one day every week. He would wake up early because of the coughing. And it would also wake up as well. Mm, okay. Aside from coughing at night, do you notice if he coughs during the day? Yes, especially when it's hot. And when he coughs, it's continuous and dry. And he sometimes even complains that his chest hurts from the coughing. And I think mm. yesterday and today, there's the whistling. Mm. Okay. Since it has been three days since his cough got worse, have you been giving him anything to make him feel better? I've been giving him jamu because I thought it was just the colds. It helps him, but only for a little while. And then I tried ginger and finally found one of his inha old inhalers, which helped stop the cough, but I ran out of the medicine. Okay, and do you know the name of that inhaler? I think it's called al albut albuterol. Albuterol, okay. But you haven't been able to give him continuously, right? No. I see. Okay. Did you notice if there's anything in particular that makes him cough more or that triggers his cough? 
I think that whenever we walk outside, his cough gets worse, especially in traffic. Mm -hmm. And also when it's very hot, that's why I've been keeping him inside the house. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does he have other symptoms like fever or runny nose? No. I, I check his temperature, but he doesn't feel hot. He doesn't even have a runny nose, which he always used to have. Now he's just been very weak. And he used to be very talkative, but now he can speak so much. He's also been eating and drinking a lot less. Mm, okay. Has he ever been diagnosed with, with asthma? Yes, doctor. Uh, the doctor told me before that he has mild to moderate asthma. Mm. Uh, okay. Uh, what about allergies or allergic rhinitis? Yes, uh, rhinitis. Okay. Did you undergo a skin test? Uh, for other allergies? I don't think so, no. Aside from the asthma, has he ever been diagnosed with other problems in the lungs? Actually, he was premature when I, he was born. He came out some weeks before I was due. So when I gave birth, the doctor told me he had a mild lung condition. I can't remember what it's called. I think it was... B B D D B D B P D. Ah, maybe bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Would it sound like that? I think so. Something like that. Okay. Okay. Um, has he had any surgery in the past? No. Okay. Uh, now I just want to ask a few questions about where you live. Um, who else lives with Riza at home? He lives with me and his dad, and we have two other children. So they're aged nine and eleven. Okay. And does anyone in the whole in the house smoke? No. Uh, my husband. He used to, but not anymore. Okay. Uh, and do your other children also have similar symptoms? My eleven-year-old daughter sometimes gets itchy eyes and a dry cough too, especially when we move to where we're living now. But her symptoms are now now are not as bad as Risa's. Her mm -hmm. asthma was worse when she was younger, but we continued to use the inhaler, so she stopped using it. She stopped needing it. Mm, okay. Uh, you said that you moved. Where do you live now? We've been living in a public housing area at the Port District for two months already. We got evicted from our old house because of a public infrastructure project in our old neighborhood. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, what are the surroundings like where you live now? Do you live near the highway or are there factories? We don't live near a highway, but we do live near a coal plant around 20 minutes from where we live. Ever mm. since we moved, Riza's breathing problems have gotten worse and all my children are getting sick more often. I see, I see. So it's very likely that your move to living near a coal plant uh, could be triggering the cough. Um, inside the house, do you use a lot of cleaning sprays or a lot of, or is there a lot of mold? No. No. Okay. What about um, your methods of cooking? Do you use uh, firewood and do you cook indoors? No, not anymore. I used to cook inside the house with firewood, but we had to stop because my, my kids would always cough whenever I had them while I was cooking. Now we just use LPG. I see. Okay. Okay, so thank you for that information. Now I just have to do a quick physical examination on Riza. Um, is that okay? Yes, doctor. Okay. Uh, so on physical examination, Riza appears quiet, uh, tired, with increased work of breathing. He is able to provide short answers to questions, but is interrupted by bouts of dry coughing. His vital signs are as follows. Temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. Blood pressure is 105 over 62. Heart rate is 120 beats per minute. Respiratory rate is, is 32 breaths per minute with oxygen saturation of 94%. His mental status is intact, oriented to person and place. Uh, head, ears, eyes, nose, and throat show moist mucous membranes. Pupils are equal and reactive to light. Chest examination shows tachycardia with no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. He is also tachypnic with uh, visible abdominal breathing uh, with decreased breath sounds at both bases with audible wheezing noted on forced expiration. 
There's also prolonged expiratory wheezing on both apices. There are also supraclavicular retractions. His abdomen is normal with salt that is soft, non-tender, and has normal active bowel sounds. His extremities are warm with no finger clubbing. His skin has notable mild circumscribed patches of dry erythematous flaky rash on the neck and flexural surfaces of both elbows and knees. Okay. Thank you, Riza, for letting me uh, examine you, and thank you also, Dara. So based on what you told me about his cough getting worse since the heat wave started and has actually caused him to have difficulty of breathing, uh, and you also notice that his cough is triggered when you walk him to school, I guess when that's uh, when uh, you're outside already. Um, it seems that his moderate asthma is in acute exacerbation or that the asthma that he's been diagnosed with is flaring up right now. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to check, we're going to monitor his oxygen. So we're going to put a pulse oximeter on him um, and then we're going to provide him with oxygen support uh, to, to help him breathe properly. We're also gonna be nebulizing him, the same as what they used to do at the ER, with beta-2 agonists um, and also colin anticholinergics. Um, and you might be here for a while just until we finish all the nebulizations and until his oxygen saturation has improved. Okay, so that's the plan for Riza, uh, Riza's asthma. Do you have any questions for me at this point? Uh, I have been told before that my son has asthma. So in the past, he used to have asthma attacks, but only when he got sick. How come it's worse now? Do you think it's because of the heat? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, and you're correct. It is very likely that the heat is triggering Riza's asthma. We're experiencing hotter temperatures now because of climate change. When it's hot, there's more risk of air pollution in general, uh, which is especially worse now when it's summer because the air can become stagnant, uh, which we can see, which we can feel now. And this can trap the dust and other pollutant particles, which is what's triggering Riza's asthma. That's why when you walk outside, uh, you notice that Riza coughs more as well. Um, and also you're more exposed because you live near a coal plant, uh, which exposes you to a lot more pollution. Um, so this combination of pollution from the coal plant and the worsening summer heat, uh, which is getting hotter and hotter because of climate change, are most likely what's triggering Riza's asthma. I see. But, uh, thank you so much, doctor, for clarifying. Okay. Happy to help. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to briefly discuss the differential diagnosis in the case of Riza, uh, who presents with cough and difficulty breathing, exacerbated by heat and air pollution. The primary impression is moderate asthma and exacerbation with differentials such as respiratory or viral infection, allergic immunitis, pneumonia, cystic fibrosis, and foreign body aspiration. The work op includes uh, pulse oximetry, peak expiratory flow measurement. We can also consider a chest x-ray, but there are no focal findings to suggest it now. The treatment may include oxygen support, inhaled beta-2 agonist via continuous nebulizer, and also inhaled anticholinergics such as iprotropium or atrovent. Uh, we would also like to administer magnesium sulfate via IV and also prescribe oral corticosteroids. Okay, so we heard the second uh, clinical case. You, you know, you might be wondering how can you uh, execute such a very comprehensive history taking and do an equally comprehensive report of the physical examination findings. Um, we're not anymore doing that a lot in the clinics. I hope this is an encouragement for us to return to the basics. And where can you also find a doctor who will tell the patient that the patient needs beta-2 agonists and anticholinergics? So let's call on again Dr. Karen Ceballos for a quick synthesis of the two cases. Karen, take it away. 
Okay, thanks, Dr. Enzo. Okay, it's me again. <laughs> I'm the doctor that prescribed beta-2 agonists. Um, uh, let me just share my screen quickly. Sorry about this. There. Is, is the screen sharing okay? Yep, we okay. can see the we can see the tab, but it's okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so again, I am Dr. Karen Sabalius, and I'll be presenting the synthesis for the clinical cases, the two clinical cases that we just saw. Um, let me just move this quickly. So with the two clinical cases that we saw were heat-related illness and air pollution. Uh, we know that heat-related illness is a direct impact of climate change. Uh, we know that warmer temperatures put us at a higher risk of heat-related illnesses. This photo shows us that our, temp uh, that our global average temperature has reached 82 degrees Celsius higher than the baseline in the 1950s. Um, and we unfortunately are on track of reaching 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, if we do not curb our greenhouse gases. So that means that we can expect more heat-related illnesses as the temperature continues to rise. Um, for clinical pearls and heat-related illness, it's important to note that heat, uh, heat stroke is not the only heat-related illness. Uh, it comes in a spectrum. Uh, the spectrum includes a heat rash, heat cramps, heat edema, and heat syncope, which are part of the mild uh, end of the spectrum. There's also the moderate, which is a heat exhaustion, and there's also the severe, which is heat stroke. Uh, it's also important to remember that heat stroke is not the same as a brain stroke or the ischemic stroke. However, both are considered uh, medical emergencies. Um, it's important to consider ischemic stroke uh, and sepsis, which mimic uh, or which can present the same as uh, heat stroke because they both have confusion uh, and headache. Um, but it's, uh, it's paramount that you do not delay the recognition of heat stroke so that you can provide adequate and timely treatment to prevent uh, permanent damage to other organs uh, and eventually death if heat stroke is not, um, is not overcome, is not treated on time. Uh, this illustration shows us the risk of heat-related illnesses result that can result from a combination of the factors listed. So there's individual susceptibility, those at extremes of age, uh, those who are very young and old, are more susceptible to heat-related illness, such as in the case of our farmer Toto, who is 62 year old, those with coexisting conditions such as cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, kidney failure, combined with their social culture, cultural factors uh, that can influence their heat exposure, all determine our risk of heat-related illness. So when considering heat-related illness in patients, it's important to gauge their risk uh, so the following questions uh, should be asked. First, we should ask about the patient's livelihood, which could influence their exposure to heat. Uh, we will know uh, their occupational health risks that are present in their livelihood. In the case of Toto, who is our fisherman, uh, since he is a fisherman, then it means that he spends several hours under the sun. But like him, farmers, construction workers, community workers who go house to house are very vulnerable also to heat-related illness. We should also ask about physical exertion that precedes the symptoms, uh, which could be beneficial for patients that do not have pre-existing conditions, such as the athletes, because they exert so much effort that they exceed their thermoregulatory boundaries, even though it's not in a very hot environment. Uh, we should also ask about their home environment, uh, their type of dwelling and their surroundings, because knowing what their house is made of and what surrounds them gives us an idea of the ventilation in their home and their access to cooling methods, such as having enough shade. In the case of Toto, he said that he lives uh, by the coast and he lives in a bamboo hut, which we know is good for natural ventilation. However, he also mentioned that there's no stable electricity, so when it's very hot and there's no wind where he is, then he will have no access to, then he will have no constant access to electric fans or other uh, cooling mechanisms. We should also ask about coexisting conditions which may get triggered or exacerbated by heat, asthma, uh, which was asthma in the previous case of Riza, our six year old male. Uh, those who are diabetic and have cardiovascular disease have impaired thermoregulatory responses 
which reduces their heat tolerance. So it's important to elicit that also in the history. We should also ask about their use of medications or drugs. Uh, I saw in the chat group that uh, during the case of Toto, someone suggested that his medications were actually exacerbating, were, were putting him at at risk of heat-related illness, and that's correct. Other medications, such as lithium, may reduce alertness and affect judgment and their perception of heat. Those on antipsychotics would have interfered hypothalamic thermoregulation. So this also impairs, impairs their body's cooling mechanism. Uh, it's also important to ask local practices that may be increasing their risk um, to heat-related illnesses. And this is not exclusive just to heat-related illness, but for several medical conditions. In the case of Toto, who had early signs of heat stroke, he had a maladaptive practice of not cooling himself down. He said that he prefers to help to let himself sweat and he doesn't like to use a cold towel because he fears getting pasma. So for the for uh, the benefit of, the, of those who don't know what pasma is, pasma was described by Dr. Michael Tan, who's an anthropologist. Uh, define it as an individual's homeostasis attained by a balance between the hot and cold elements. So if there's an imbalance between a hot and cold, then they will be prone to having an illness. A person like Toto who believes in pasma will not, for example, take a shower after running because they fear that their warm body should not be exposed to cold water So because they may get pasma. Someone uh, who believes in pasma will also not wash their hands right after ironing their clothes uh, because they think that cold water will get them, will make them pasma. So this is a Philippine phenomenon that still needs to be studied. And while there are social science explanations, there may also be physiological ones. So it's important to carefully navigate patient interactions such as this, especially if we want to have meaningful uh, conversations with them about how to treat their illnesses. First, they, we should understand and acknowledge their patients' beliefs. As healthcare practitioners, uh, we should understand and acknowledge their beliefs, uh, and we should not outright dismiss uh, their beliefs just because it doesn't strictly align with our Western medicine. In the case of PASMA, there is nothing strictly wrong with resting a bit before taking a bath. So in the case of TOTO, there is nothing incorrect with letting himself sweat because this is a thermoregulatory mechanism of the body to cool down. And next, we should also provide evidence-based advice. In the case of Toto, if he refuses to cool down with a cold towel, we can suggest that he uses a towel soaked in room temperature, uh, which is not uh, cold for the Philippines, which will still be effective in cooling the body down because it will still cause uh, evaporation in hot skin. Um, there. And it's important also to... Take the patient encounter as an opportunity to educate them, uh, especially when it comes to heat-related illnesses where uh, awareness may be still low uh, because we are very used to heat. We might not think that we could actually get sick from them. So it's important to educate the patient and their family or caregivers, especially for the older uh, patients, um, to prevent heat-related illnesses. So we can show them um, infographics such as this on how to avoid heat stroke. Uh, how to recognize heat stroke by knowing the signs, and also what the first aid measures can be while waiting for further help. On a public uh, health setting, we know that urban environment is at higher risk uh, for heat-related illnesses because the built environment of the urban setting intensifies the effects of high temperatures, which affects its overall livability. What we know is the urban heat island effect um, what makes uh, those urban dwellers at higher risk at heat, of heat-related illnesses because there is reduced vegetation, which means there's less shade and moisture to keep the area cool. The properties of urban materials, which is usually concrete, determines how the sun's energy is reflected, emitted, and, absor and absorbed. The urban geometry or the dimensions, the height and width of buildings and the spacing between buildings. And human-related activities that also generate heat, such as air conditioning of buildings and energy to run appliances or transportation, all contribute to the urban heat island effect. So we can see in this diagram that the graph is higher, is concentrated uh, in the urban setting in the cities. In the photo on the right, we see the Philippines, uh, which has the highest, where the highest heat 
health risk index is in this cap is in its capital in Manila City. It's shaded red. Uh, while the rest of the cities in Metro Manila are actually among the top 20 in the countries with the highest health, highest heat health risk index. So here we see that those at highest risk are really those that live in the cities. Sorry. Okay. Um, so our important public, important public health messaging should include in terms of heat-related illness on how to protect against heat stroke and also reminders to stay hydrated, to rest, and to stay in the shade. So it's important to spread awareness and to communicate what the individual and their workplaces can do to protect them. Um, heat public advisories to extreme heat are also being released now in certain countries. In Hong Kong, they developed a new heat warning to protect outdoor workers from uh, hot weather. So they receive notifications on their app. Uh, Thailand issues a don't go out warning, especially when it hit the heat index of 54 degrees Celsius in April. Um, in weather forecasts such as that in the Philippines, there are heat index charts, which include the temperature and how health could be affected. So at 27 to 32 degrees Celsius, we should practice caution. Uh, but at 52 degrees and Celsius, uh, 52 degrees Celsius and beyond, there is extreme danger uh, and heat stroke is imminent. So we should heed these public advisories as well. To know more about heat health, I invite you to uh, check out the Global Heat Health Information Network, uh, which is an independent forum of scientists, practitioners, and policymakers to improve the capacity uh, to protect populations from avoidable health risks. You can also sign up to their newsletter, which I find very uh, helpful. Uh, next, we go to the second case, which is air pollution. In the case of Riza, a six-year-old male, presenting with cough and difficulty of breathing. Uh, so as mentioned in the lecture earlier, we know that human activities emit greenhouse gas emissions, primarily from the burning of fossil fuels, such as oil, coal, and gas. Uh, these gases we emit do not just directly cause air pollution, but they also drive climate change. Climate change influences air quality through rising temperatures uh, that increase the presence of pollutants such as ground ozone, smog, air allergens, and carbon dioxide. It also produces longer allergy season, which I saw in the chat box also earlier. Uh, and it also causes changes in weather patterns. So when there's higher humidity, there's less air circulation. So the pollutants are trapped in the air. And all of this have health impacts that we have learned today, uh, such as exacerbation of asthma, cardiovascular disease, premature death, etc. So for clinical pearls, uh, when faced with a patient whose respiratory condition is primarily because of air pollution, it's important to ask the following, as we did in the case of Riza. Uh, it's important to ask uh, the triggers of their cough because that will help us narrow down what they need to avoid if it's avoidable. Uh, we should also probe on the exposure that could trigger their cough, which could include changes in temperature, traffic and other kinds of pollution, cigarette smoke, uh, wood burning. We should also ask about their home environment, uh, such as in the case of heat-related illness as well, because their type of dwelling and surroundings tells us also about their exposure. In the case of Riza, though he doesn't live near a highway, he lives near a coal-fired power plant, which emits so much pollution. Uh, and we can appreciate that in this photo taken by Greenpeace in Indonesia, where uh, the children are playing and the, there's a coal-fired power plant in the background. So we can just expect that there are high levels of asthma and other uh, pollution-related illnesses as well. We should also ask about their history of allergies, uh, again, to know their triggers. We should also ask about their history of asthma and other respiratory illnesses so we know uh, their baseline respiratory function. Uh, lastly, we should also ask about their medication, whether they use antihistamines, steroids, or inhalers. For asthma, it generally warrants the use of inhalers. Younger kids, though they can't directly use inhalers, so they would need spacers, uh, the problem is that they might not be using it properly, so they're not maximizing the effect of the medication. So if a mother uh, or if a parent tells you, doc, the medication is not working, it's important to take that opportunity to probe how they're using the medication, if they're using an inhaler, uh, if they're using a spacer, and if they're not, then they should be properly taught so that uh, they, can, they can maximize the benefits of this medication. Uh, we should also remember that children are more uh, vulnerable 
uh, to air pollution because their lungs are still developing. Uh, they breathe faster. Uh, they're closer to the ground, so they have increased exposure to air pollutants. Um, and we also see that in this, on the photo on the right, how children are more vulnerable to air pollution, how their exposure is different from the adults, and how the pollution affects children and adolescents differently. Early and recent exposure to certain pollutants um, can cause prolonged asthma or persistent asthma until young adulthood, uh, which is why it's very important to minimize exposure as a critical step in managing asthma. So this is a table that shows us the health interventions that we can take uh, to prevent uh, air pollution related illnesses. On an individual level, we can encourage them to stay indoors, especially when, the poor, when there's poor air quality. We can suggest that they use a mask, preferably the N95 when there's poor air quality. They can also use air filters, such as HEPA filters at home. And we suggest that they switch to safe uh, cooking stoves, so preferably nothing that would entail wood burning. Uh, for those individuals that are not pediatric but would like to reduce their comorbidities and reduce disease exacerbations, they should also engage in active transportation such as cycling or walking. Uh, they can get into plant-based diet and they can get into routine preventive care uh, such as tobacco cessation and vaccines. For those that are uh, reducing their disease exacerbations, they should control their asthma or COPD and undergo allergen sensitization. Uh, on a public health setting, this is a way of checking the air quality index. When uh, you can go on weather.com, I went on the website earlier, and then I checked the air quality in, air, in Jakarta, Indonesia this morning. And the, the air quality index is at 162, which tells us that the air is unhealthy and the dominant pollutant is uh, particulate matter 2.5. So when we see that the air quality index is uh, poor, then we suggest that you stay indoors or at least limit the time outdoors and also wear, nine, wear N95 if you must go outdoors. Um, as public health, uh, as clinical, as healthcare practitioners who are now acquainted with climate change and health, we can also be advocates uh, and include in our public health messaging the avoidance of burning anything inside and around the house, uh, which could trigger cough. That means uh, no smoking, whether tobacco or otherwise. Avoid cooking with wood, especially inside the house. And we can also discourage uh, open burning of plastic waste, uh, which can, which is, uh, unfortunately done in several communities, uh, such as in the Philippines. Um, we can also suggest um, on a population level to advocate the support of policies and movements that reduce fossil fuel burning, and also advocate the support of preserving forests and green spaces, which ultimately preserve our air quality. Okay, so I'm just going back to this uh, slide, which was shown earlier by Dr. Lalas. I just want to present again the cycle of air pollution and climate change. So we know that climate change makes air pollution worse. Uh, hot temperatures trigger more reactions between pollutants, causing more smog and secondary air pollutants. Uh, on the other hand, air pollution also makes climate change worse. We know that many common air pollutants are also greenhouse gases. And these greenhouse gases trap radiation uh, and heat and prevent it from dissipating off the Earth's surface, which also increases global temperatures. So basically, both air pollution and climate change are created by the same sources, fossil fuels, industries, agriculture. So when we say uh, fight against climate change, we mean we, we have to reduce the sources of greenhouse gases to mitigate climate change. And in effect, we also prevent air pollution. And that's it. Just to end this slide, I just wanted to end with this quote by Margaret Mead, the cultural, cultural anthropologist. She said that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens such as us can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Karen Sebalis, for that very comprehensive summary of uh, the two cases. Uh, and indeed, you know, we're actually creating now not just a small group, but a 300 plus strong group of climate and health responders that are ready to face the health 
impacts, consequences of climate change. So again, thank you very much. That is a very helpful uh, summary. Um, also, I really appreciate all the clinical and the public health pearls, uh, how to take a comprehensive environmental history of our patients, uh, and also how to you know, think more broadly uh, as to how to influence uh, the health of uh, entire communities and populations. So now we reach the end of our session four. We're actually already halfway in the course. So you, uh, I hope you're already realizing we've done, we've, we've done the intro session one, disasters and extreme weather events session two, infectious diseases session three, and today non-communicable diseases session four. And in the chat box a while ago, many of you are already beginning to ask questions regarding mental health. So that is our session five on Tuesday, same time. And I hope that you will all be there. So, wow, congratulations to all of you for making it halfway. We're now at the midpoint of the course. And we really look forward to seeing you in the remaining four sessions uh, of this Southeast Asia Climate and Health Responder course. So yeah, be safe. Uh, today has been a very challenging day for the Philippines with typhoon, with a volcanic uh, eruption or uh, an impending volcanic eruption and an earthquake. But with all of you being prepared to uh, face these challenges, um, we will definitely uh, be able to overcome uh, these threats and ensure the health of not just the people, but also the, also the planet. Thank you again. Stay safe and see you on Tuesday. Goodbye.